I'm so excited to bring to you our seventh live interview with one of the wonderful individuals we met along the journey of making and screening the film Medicating Normal. Our guest today is Chris Page. Chris is a licensed psychotherapist and a coach with over 27 years of experience helping people heal from traumatic experiences. He's highly skilled in healing trauma. He's been featured on Dateline NBC for his work with children of divorce, as well as in the national publication Muses and Visionaries, where he wrote a monthly column called On the Couch with Chris Page. He's trained in hypnosis, EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, the safe and sound protocol and somatic psychotherapy, all of which he incorporates into his work. He also offers a unique perspective as a member of the prescribed harm community. He endured his own iatrogenic injury from prescribed psychiatric medications. And you can find more information about him at chrispagelcsw.com. So welcome, Chris, and thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Nicole, for having me. Very excited to be part of this. Yeah, so um, I think Chris is going to start out by telling everybody a little bit more about himself and his story, how he became involved in the prescribed psychiatric medication harm community, just as a uh, sort of backup thing. He has done an interview at Madden America before, so there's a more in-depth version of his story there if anybody wants to go check that out after um, we finish up today. But yeah, so I'll pass it over to you, Chris, and you can just sort of introduce yourself. Great. Thanks, Nicole, and uh, happy holidays to everybody out there listening and just excited for this opportunity. Um, well, my story basically, I think, starts at birth. <laughs> like all of our story. Um, and I was adopted, had some birth trauma from that, and then had some trauma throughout my childhood, um, which led me, I think, two things, uh, into psychotherapy as a profession and into psychiatry as a patient. And unfortunately, it was that entry into psychiatry as a patient that led me to be talking to you all right now. Um, basically, I'd had anxiety probably predominantly throughout my teen years and college years that was from trauma. And even though I'd been in the field for years, I'd never really had anybody make the connection that trauma could be causing any of this. Uh, it kind of came to a head when I got divorced around the year 2000 and I was super stressed and was actually studying with a friend uh, for grad school. And she said, you look really agitated. Here, why don't you take this? It's called clonopin. And I took half a milligram of clonopin and it was like the, the air had been let out of the balloon. I felt such relaxation and relief. Called my doctor and said, you know, would you be willing to prescribe this? They had no issue with it, put me on it on a daily dose and took that for a few years and started to notice I was having memory issues. Tapered off of it, was off it for a few years and then some life stress happened again. And I asked my doctor for 10 one milligram clonopin tablets. She gave me 20 um, and I took 16 total milligrams over the next three and a half months. And because I didn't understand about half-lives and understand about some other things we'll probably talk about today, like kindling, the drug actually never left my body. So I was getting dependent and didn't realize it. I immediately went into a, something called tolerance where the medicine was no longer giving me any relief. And it was then that out of desperation, I consented to go to a medical detox. Uh, they took me off a milligram and a quarter of clonopin in five days. That's the equivalent of 25 milligrams of Valium. As I understand now, a taper off a milligram and a quarter of clonopin, if you do it conservatively, should take probably between two to five years, uh, not two to five days. Um, and because of that incredible shock to my nervous system, I was severely injured and disabled, disabled for years. Um, it's been six and a half years now since the detox. And I'll say I'm 110% I'm, I'm me with a 70% functioning nervous system. So I'm much better. Um, the fact that I can sit calmly and speak to you is just signs of my own healing. So it was that then that led on this journey of insanity and suicidal ideation and hanging on every moment of my life for a few years, for three years. Um, and getting through to the other side now and committing myself to 
advocacy that I hope will create prevention so that other people do not suffer what I suffer. So um, during that time, you say the three years that was like the worst of your withdrawal syndrome, you had akathisia. Um, do you want to talk some about what akathisia is and how it manifested? Sure. Uh, and I think this is going to be kind of an ongoing topic of this. And it's something that I'm committed to in terms of research and committed to in terms of changing the idea. Akathisia is basically the inability to sit caused by agitation and restlessness caused by neurotoxic reactions to psychiatric medications. What akathisia is, is a pacing, a movement you know, trembling, you can, it's all kinds of different movements, but predominantly pacing. When the agitation and restlessness gets so severe that you can no longer sit still, you can no longer sit down. And I, even having taught multiple semesters of psychopathology to master's level social work students, I barely knew what akathisia was before this happened. And what I've learned is nobody really knows what akathisia is, but I think I have an idea what because I think I'm in a kind of unique opportunity where I'm both a medical professional and a, a, somebody that suffered and recovered from akathisia. I think what's missing is the fact that, as anybody that's experienced it knows, that when the agitation and restlessness gets so bad, you can't sit still. You can't suppress those movements. You have to move. And ironically, the DSM-5, which isn't always right about a lot, is spot on with most of what it describes with akathisia which is when the move, when the agitation and restlessness is bad, you cannot contain the movement. That's akathisia. But people can still have agitation and restlessness so severe that they want to take their lives. That's just not akathisia. Mm -hmm. That's severe agitation and restlessness, which is horrific. And I can still get very agitated at times as my nervous system heals, but I no longer have to move or pace. And because I no longer have to move in pace, I no longer have akathisia. And this isn't to dismiss anybody's suffering. People are suffering horribly, but they can be suffering horribly and not have akathisia. And as somebody that wants to do research in this, what I'm finding is that we need language to communicate with doctors because, and pharmacists, because those are the people that we want to be the front line to change this. And if we can't agree what akathisia is, it's like a cat, a cat has four legs, okay? An armadillo is different from a cat. And if I said, well, my armadillo is a cat, it's absurdity, okay? And then we can't agree on anything. We have to find consensus, okay? The medical community's view of akathisia is too narrow. The withdrawal community's view of akathisia is way too broad, mm -hmm. including symptoms like fatigue, okay? That's like saying I'm plugged into the sun. I'm so restless. I want to rip my spine out of my body. I'm going to lie down and take a nap. Okay, it's absurdity. Okay, we need doctors to understand the severity. This is a severe, severe condition. Right. But if we muddy the waters with a variety of symptoms that have nothing to do with akathisia, then we will never get what we want, which is consensus, prevention research and truth. Mm -hmm. So you know, well, the audience probably doesn't know, but you know that you and I are friends and we met in the withdrawal support community. Um, I had akathisia um, for a long time at the beginning of my withdrawal syndrome, but you and I met after mine had improved and yours was just starting. <laughs> um, but I, you have definitely honed in on akathisia more and done a lot more focused research on the topic it, itself. Do you think there is, like from what you found, a lot of misunderstanding in medicine about akathisia and is the language and everything that's in the medical literature, is it insufficient or what's out there? It's basically consensus about no consensus. Mm -hmm that we can agree we don't know. But I think the re reason is, is because there haven't been enough people that have experienced it and then also can translate it to a medical terminology. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that 
the first case of akathisia that was report, recorded in medical literature, believe it or not, was from the mid to late 1600s, mm -hmm. when a guy named Thomas Willis was like the first neurologist in the, ever in the 1600s. I had a couple patients that were so tortured that they could not sit still. And ironically, four or 500 years later, we still haven't figured this out. Um, but I think historically also, the person that coined the term akathisia was a, a neurologist in the early 1900s, in 1903. And what he struggled with at that time was, is this a movement disorder and or a hysterical disorder? Mm -hmm. And he sided more with the movement disorder, but I think we would all agree it's both. It's the movement and the hysteria, the subjective terror, the subjective restlessness and agitation. Another person in the early 1900s talked about feeling like you wanted to rip your spine. And for anybody that's had akathisia, for me at least, it feels like it's emanating from my spine. Mm -hmm. As if my spine is vibrating violently like a tuning fork, and that energy is emanating out to my body. And it's that agitation restlessness that emanates out but that causes me, causes me to start having to, to do this because I have to somehow get the energy out. But that's another horrible thing with akathisia is even though I would pace 12 to 14 hours a day, it gave me no relief. There was no relief. It was just, I had to pace. I could not possibly sit still. Mm -hmm. The agitation was that severe. And that to me is kind of what I'm going to be looking at research wise is how do we get doctors to look at the very first thing they should screen every single patient for is agitation and restlessness. Mm -hmm. We've decided pain 25 years ago with both good and bad consequences was a vital sign. Mm -hmm. Well, agitation and restlessness should be a vital sign too because it is the precursor, I believe, to an enormous amount of undocumented suicides that we can't pinpoint the reason why. When I think agitation and restlessness is the reason why, because the person is so desperate for relief, they will do anything to get that relief. I call it killing themselves against their will. Yeah. No one wants to die in this. Mm -hmm. We all want to live. And if I give anybody a message out there suffering right now, hang in there, it gets better. I promise you it gets better. If I can get better, anybody can get better. I was out of my mind. Nicole will validate that. Mm -hmm. I was completely out of my mind. And not only that, my voice now is back to normal. Instead of that high pitched voice where I was screaming, oh my God, like I was taking a, a, a hit off a helium balloon because mm -hmm. I was so frantic and agitated and miserable and just wanted to get out of my body. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the beauty of. Um you know, people in the harmed community talking to each other because we can speak this language that people who haven't experienced this, you, you, there's no words for it, but for people who have, like we can almost finish each other's sentences in some instances. And when you had told me that you read about that description of it coming from the spine, I was like, yes, like, it, it suddenly put words to something because I always said like it's in my spine, you know, um, but I didn't know how to like communicate that because half of the stuff it's so bizarre, so outside the realm of human experiences that you say these things and they just sound so crazy. And, and that's the problem because we're taking psych drugs and we're already viewed as crazy. Right. And when you act crazy. <laughs> Right. But in an, an another token where you say, you know, backing up to what you said, you know, you weren't taught about it in school. I'm a physician assistant. I went to medical school. I was, I, there was, I had never heard the word akathisia before until I experienced it myself either. But when you say, Chris, that there should be like a screening tool for akathisia, to me, it's like, uh, the way that people present when they have akathisia, it's just so obvious that it's akathisia. Like if you can read the description and the way that people behave, I mean, explain a little bit more for people what you looked like and sounded like to the observer when you were in active akathisia. I looked like the guy I used to fear at the bus stop. Okay. pacing, talking to myself, threatening suicide, frantic, punching myself. 
a real treat for social engagements and parties. So feel free to invite me over. It was ridiculous. I repelled everybody around me. Nobody wanted to be around me. My energy, energy was toxic. I think we've all been around people where you can feel their energy and you're like, oh, I don't really like being around them. I don't want to get away from them. That was me on steroids. I was unbearable to be around. But you I have- I can myself. <laughs> And I can speak to this because I spoke to you for hours and hours and hours on the phone when you were going through it. But I also know how I was when I had it. And it was incredibly similar, you know, the pressured speech, the like, you know, you, when you're talking, it's like the words are just because you're so frantically trying to communicate how you feel like the desperation in the messages that you're giving to other people, the squirming around the constant moving. I mean, I, I know you and I have talked about it, how for people who aren't actively suffering um, or, or who have gotten past the, the phase of it where you are moment to moment, like thinking about dying, in hindsight, you can look back on some of the behaviors and actually laugh because some of it, you know, you looked like a lunatic and you behaved like one. But Chris and I laugh because one of my family members, I would go in and out of the house hundreds of times a day out the door because I was pacing and so, you know, just agitated and, and had to move because I had akathisia. And this family member would say to me, are you going for another walk? Like as if it was just normal for someone to walk, you know, 453 times a day, just in and out the door, in and out the door. And it, it's so weird to me that like people around us can't like grasp that something really bad is going on and doctors too. What's funny, I'm writing a bunch of stuff on akathisia because I want to do research on it. And the reality is, is if we would switch one simple thing, which is instead of doctors seeing agitation as based in mental illness, if you saw that agitation as based as a side effect from a medicine, if we just did that one thing and that was the first question asked and considered, and we kind of did a forensic autopsy of the medicines they've been taking and kind of retraced when this happened. Yeah not rocket science, it's right there in front of us. And that's the other thing I'm gonna, you know, that I'm presenting that I wanna update clinically for this is there's a prodromal phase for people that don't get the acute onset, immediate raging akathisia. Mm -hmm. And what a prodrome means is subclinical, there are subclinical symptoms that if you look for them, you'll see them. So a lot of people that have akathisia, there are a large portion that get an immediate onset, but then there are other proportions, other people that it's a cumulative effect of medicines being changed and switched and doses changed. And then when that happens, when that akathisia, that chronic akathisia kicks in, we then need doctors to understand, to step back and not touch us and not have to solve it right now and just educate our support system so they don't abandon us at that point. And I'll say to everybody out there, one of the main reasons I'm sitting here talking to you today is Nicole Lambers, because she kept me alive. When everyone else in my life was not terribly interested in me being alive, she kept me alive. And it's these types of relationships that we form in this journey that support and keep us going. And I would say to anybody out there that's going through this, find a buddy. Find one other person that you can lean on because Nicole and I still to this day will lean on each other at times as friends. And it's these relationships out of this that really give us the movement forward and, and allow us to survive this. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be like, Chris and I did not know each other from Adam. I don't even know how we ever came to talk in the first place, but when you're in these desperate situations, you know, all of the stuff about what your parents told you about the predators on the internet and all that stuff goes out the window. There are some really good people in psychiatric drug withdrawal who are online and in these groups. And, you know, if you can partner up with people who your story aligns with and, you know, it's, I don't know how anybody survives you know, moderate to severe withdrawal without finding people who are going through it. But I guess that kind of brings us into the next thing, Chris, is the support system. Um, you're big on that. Having a solid support system is like one of the cornerstones of being able to survive 
akathisia, but just, you know, psychiatric drug withdrawal in general. So do you want to speak to that some? Sure. You know, I think it's the, it's the number one variable that keeps people alive. You know, again, if we're going to use akathisia as the example, for acute akathisia, which is the immediate within a couple of days or hours or minutes of a medicine, then, you know, insight is what saves people. Oh, it's the medicine. Oh, it's causing this. When people don't know it's the medicine, that's when they kill themselves often because they have no idea what's happening. Mm -hmm. But if it becomes chronic, then social support is the variable that keeps people alive. From my six and a half years of experience, most people with chronic akathisia don't kill themselves unless there are precipitating events directly related to social support problems. And I've seen not only absence of social support, but I've seen incredibly horrible, negative, antithetical, anti, I call it anti-social support, where people are almost encouraging the person to kill themselves because they're tired of hearing about it. I know we're exhausting, we're overwhelming. Oh yeah. We need you. We need our mothers and fathers, our sisters and brothers, our daughters and sons, our cousins, our nephews, our friends. Every, you know, it takes a village to raise the child. Well, guess what else? It takes a village to help somebody survive akathisia or survive iatrogenic injury. But the problem is, is the village hasn't gotten the memo yet. And until the doctors are reinforcing to the support systems that this is what it is and not our mental illness or any other thing, the problem will never end. Yeah. If they don't know what it is, they, they turn on you, you know, or, um, give you the tough love or, um, you know, tell you that you need the medicine because clearly you're acting erratic and that kind of thing, or, there's the whole, you're a drug addict. If you happen to get akathisia from benzodiazepines because they're a controlled substance, but you can get akathisia from medications that are not controlled substances too, right? Other right. drugs can yeah. cause it. There are hundreds of medicines that like are believed to cause akathisia, which I kind of find ironic because we don't know what akathisia is. Mm -hmm. But um, my focus is on psychiatric and because they are the primary cause of that. Another thing that just kind of popped in my head that we didn't mention when we were talking about, you know, because I think it's important if we're going to talk about akathisia to talk about how it manifested and what it looked like and what people can look for in other people who may not have the word akathisia in their vocabulary yet to say, this is what I'm having. But both of us had blisters, bleeding blisters on our feet from the amount of walking and pacing that we did. So, I mean, that's just- <laughs> Which is why it makes me crazy when people say akathisia and fatigue. I mean, you don't think I wanted to sit with bloody open feet? I wanted to sit, I can promise you that. Yeah. I couldn't, Yeah, it was impossible. So I had to pace 12 to 14 hours every day until it sort of burned out in the night as my cortisol probably lowered. And then 4.35 a.m., they would just repeat the same cycle again. I think what it is, though, is, again, back to that prodromal idea. We need to have doctors to be able to have language because that's one of the main reasons akathisia is underdiagnosed and not seen is that we're not asking the right questions. We're not saying to a, to a patient, do you feel like you can't sit still? Do you feel like there's, you know, your spine is vibrating? Do you feel like there are ants inside and you've got, you're restless and you can't move? Sometimes we have to coach them. So they go, oh yeah, that's what it is. But if we ask them, are you agitated? Most people go, no, I'm not agitated, but they might be restless. And that's the other thing too, is that we have to teach doctors to see it here before it gets here. You know, If we can see it here, then we can take remediation and other preventative measures to keep it from escalating to when it crosses over and becomes severe. Yeah, like even just, I mean, for in my situation and yours, I know the reason we got it was because we were brutally cold turkeyed from medications that should have been tapered incredibly slowly. So right. if the medical professionals had known what akathisia was and it manifested immediately after such a large dose reduction, it sh the dose should have been put back to where it was in yeah. person. Yes. Exactly. stabilized and then tapered slowly and appropriately, you know? Well, it's like for me, when I was in the detox or in the outpatient program after the detox, they diagnosed me with a social anxiety disorder because they said I couldn't sit in groups. <laughs> oh, and I, <laughs> I, I was sit. yeah in a similar <laughs> detox center being 
scolded and yelled at because I didn't come to the meetings either. I was too busy running up and down the hallway and circling exactly. outside in the garden, you know. <laughs> but I was scolded for being non-compliant with my care. And Chris, you, know. you just don't want to get better, Chris. You know, if you would just engage in 12-step programs, this severe neurological injury will just remedy itself. Well, yeah. I sat in a ton of 12-step meetings and guess what? Didn't remedy my injury. Yeah. And that's another thing is, is that people get forced into things that are completely inappropriate. Individual psychotherapy, completely inappropriate. Supportive. How can you, how right? can you have psychotherapy when your mind is going a million miles a minute? You can't even speak without pressured language. You can't sit in a chair, let alone, I mean, you're going to ask somebody to start digging into the depths of their past yeah. trauma. I mean, that experience when you were 13. No, it just, it, it doesn't work. And, and, the only thing that does work is support and supportive coaching. You know, it does benefit to have somebody like me that's trained talk to a family member or talk to, you know, I can't take the akathisia away, but I can definitely improve social support. But some and that's of the, I can really make a difference. Some of the experiences you've had even trying to talk, be a social support or to talk to people's social supports, their parents, You've been hung up on by people's. Yes, I have. <laughs> Why do you think it's so hard for people's support to believe or to like I grasp? Think, I think one of the things that we never give enough credit to about why the social support is so hard is they're terrified. They're terrified. Mm -hmm. They love us. They don't want us to die, mm -hmm. but they don't know what to do. They're scared. And what do humans do when they don't know what to do and they feel helpless? They project it onto the other person. They go, oh, I can't tolerate this helplessness. So you just don't want to fix it because I can't tolerate my own inability to fix it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think then you mix in a past anxiety history or a past alcohol history or a past whatever history. And they go, oh, it's see, it's just the worst version of you when it's not. It's an incredibly injured exaggerated version of me that just needs basically to be told I need to be held in a cocoon okay I can't do anything to remedy this but I need my social support system to say you're safe you're okay your basic needs will be met you're loved you're believed you're understood if you give somebody that the the in the odds of them living are almost a hundred percent once it passes that acute horrid you know and again, these are words that I'm going to be changing because I don't like the terminology that we've attached to akathisia. It's kind of meaningless to me. What's more important to me is the immediate onset versus the chronic. Both horrific. One is not worse or better than the other, but they're different syndromes mm -hmm. that need different interventions and a different analysis from a medical perspective of immediate onset Akathisia, stop the medicine immediately. Stop it. It's like poison. Get it out of your body. The akathisia generally remits. But once you get past a certain time frame, of which we have no clue what that time frame is, is it a week, two weeks, six hours, 10 days? I think it's probably also very variable for each of us. Once you cross over into that chronic phase, then stopping the medicine would be catastrophic. It would be the antithesis of the, of the right decision. Mm -hmm. You know, it would cause the person actually probably to suicide. That would be the most likely outcome if you take somebody off medication when they're in an active phase of akathisia. And so the idea then is we need to get doctors to understand that while these are, they present similarly clinically in terms of symptoms, they're different. And they're different in terms of, I think, the brain neurochemistry origins. And that's another thing that I'm interested in writing about is we have antipsychotics, we have antidepressants, we have benzodiazepines. They all have different mechanisms of action, mm -hmm. but they all cause akathisia. How does that happen? How is it that medicines that target different neurotransmission systems in the brain lead to the same outcome? And that's another, that's where I think if we can solve that puzzle, we can then figure out ways, targeted ways, maybe to actually treat akathisia when it becomes active. And just one thing that came up for me when you were talking about the support systems um, to why they behave the way that they do sometimes. Also, they are going to the doctor's appointments and stuff with 
the person who's affected and they're they're being told that it's not real or so the medical community is harming the patient as well by misinforming their caregivers and so the caregivers are more prone to listen to a physician than just little old you you know who's been hysterical for six months and acting completely crazy and out of character and all that they default to well this is the neurologist or well i had this experience and i think it's a common experience is my stepmother and i getting ready to go see the new psychiatrist the month after the detox hopeful that he'll have some remedy or solution mm -hmm. sit there for the next 45 minutes watching the alliance go from my stepmother's alliance with me to by the end of the session, her alliance being completely with the doctor and leaving the session feeling a thousand times worse and invalidated because now my social system, my social support system has now been armed with information to use against me. Somebody asked what helped you, Chris? <laughs> um, well, the people that know me know I had a simple slogan, which is I'm just not gonna kill myself today. Mm -hmm. And as long as I stuck to that rule, I made it to the next day. But there were at least 500 times that if a gun safety had clicked off, that I would not be here. And, but I am. And what I really learned on this journey is the will to live is incredible. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would say to anybody that's lost someone to suicide, but they didn't want to kill themselves. They were in pain or they felt there was no hope and they couldn't tolerate it anymore. But this is kind of crazy, but what they did was incredibly strong in a way. People say, oh, it's so weak. Really? You ever stood on a bridge and thought about jumping off? Well, until you do, don't tell anybody about how weak they are. Mm -hmm. uh, we need love and compassion. And it just doesn't go for people injured. It goes for all of us. We need love and compassion and connectedness. That's what keeps us alive. That's the miracle of how I survived, is I had no love and connection. And I still survived. Part because you gave me love and connection. Mm -hmm. And if two or three other people did, if they didn't, I would not be here, I guarantee you. And it's a tragedy that we have people killing themselves as we speak right now because the medical system has not understood something that's been around since 1670. Mm -hmm. And it's my job, I feel, to do everything I can to help them understand this. Again, for me, it was the, you know, I'm buying a car tomorrow and it's like my dream car and it's that moment tomorrow, I'm gonna cry. I'm gonna sit in the car and cry because I made it. And this is another part of that journey of rebuilding my life. And again, for anybody out there that lost everything, I lost everything, everything. You can get it all back and it will be better than it ever was. Mm -hmm. I promise you. So I, maybe I'm asking questions sort of backwards, but um, you are really passionate about the topic of trauma. Yes. And so how do you think a trauma history makes somebody vulnerable to taking psychiatric medications, um, becoming harmed by psychiatric medications. How do you think that plays into this? Well, I think that trauma really for all, you know, we all have different interpretations in our nervous systems of what's traumatic. Some people's nervous systems can see something and it won't affect them. Other people can see the exact same thing and their nervous system will be dramatically affected by it. And I think that's an important thing we haven't even really talked about enough is neurodivergence. The fact that we're not all wired the same. You know, that, that we all have different skill sets and different inherent just neurochemical and neurophysiological differences. Thank God that make us unique and interesting and, and, and good at some things and, and, and not good at other things. But I think a history of trauma lays the foundation for entry into the mental health system because until just recently we weren't even looking at it as, as, a, as, a, as a problem or a an entry issue with, which caused people to get you know symptomatology from it. and i think we now are knowing because of incredible books like 
this by Gabor Mate when the body says no, or this one, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. These are two books I would recommend highly for anybody that wants to learn about trauma or just kind of interested in their own journey. But I think from, for me, for my trauma, I was adopted at birth. And the first experience I had in life was being taken away from my mother. So I think the first thing I experienced in life was, <clears throat> was going like that. That would be the normal physiological response that a mammal would have if it was taken away from its mother. Well, what did I develop as a child? Asthma. What is asthma? <gasps> it's the same, it's as though my body stored the memory and it would play itself out. About 35 years later, I was doing EMDR with a therapist on myself and I was dating a psychologist at the time. And she said to me, why are you ashamed of your adoption? And it opened Pandora's box. And for the next 40 minutes, I relived my birth physiologically because there's no cognitive memory, but the body does remember everything. So I felt the terror and the agony and the fear and all the feelings I had as that infant being taken away. Well, after I had that powerful 30 to 40 minute ab reaction, when I discharged all that pain and energy I, I, I held on for so long, I never had an asthma attack. Either. And it was as if that energy by being discharged, it freed my body up again to function the way it was designed to function. And I think that's my job as a, as a trauma therapist and a central nervous system therapist is to kind of gently reset, find ways to reset our nervous system, the factory setting. Okay, so we kind of can, can undo the trauma, the overreactions, the underreactions, mm -hmm. you know, however our body has manifested that traumatic reaction and how it plays out in our current life. That's the other thing with trauma. It's in the past, but our body has not released it into the past or processed it from the short term into the long term memory. So it stays fresh. And that's why a Vietnam veteran 50 years removed from Vietnam still hates the 4th of July because the sound of an explosion of a firework tricks their brain into thinking that there's incoming mortar shells. And again, the way my brain is built, here is the part of my brain going, hey, it's 4th of July, it's 2020, those are fireworks, I'm safe. Back here is the part of my brain going, danger, 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 loud noise, scary, incoming fire. Well, which part's gonna win? This is gonna win every time. You know. I wouldn't survive as a species if I could go, wait, I gotta stop and get something to eat while that tiger's chasing, okay? And that's back to the idea with trauma too, is that to me, when is an, a mammal most at risk in the wild? When they're sleeping, okay? What is the primary thing that gets people into their general practitioner and psychiatrist's thoughts? Insomnia, fatigue, and hypersomnia. Okay. What's the second most dangerous time for a mammal in the wild? Eating. How many times have you watched the National Geographic video? The antelope is drinking out of the water hole. The crocodile sneaks up and grabs it. Okay. We're always going to be overprepared with our nervous systems. And that's where the trauma manifests again. But back to that second thing. What's the second primary problem that gets people into doctor's offices? Overeating, undereating, the consequences of poor eating, diabetes, okay? So if we look at it, there was just a great article in Psychology Today. And it's one of those moments where I'm like, damn, I didn't get that out fast enough. But a person said what I've been saying for years, depression is just a nervous system response to stress. If you think about it, if the real world is attacking me and I feel unsafe, what's the primary behavioral manifestation of depression is isolation. If I'm isolated from other mammals, they can't attack me, but they also can't soothe me or comfort me or connect me. And so the very thing that the depression serves me, it disconnects me from the pain, but then it disconnects me from everything. And then I get put on an antidepressant and because of the mechanism of the antidepressant, I get chronic depression. When I first started in the field in the early 90s, the DSM-3R was the DSM. We're up to the five now. It said specifically in the diagnosis of major depressive disorder, if untreated, it would go away within six months. 
And it also said in the DSM 3R, if there had been a recent loss or death, then you had to rule that out because that clearly is not a major depressive problem. It's a, a grief and loss problem. Well, now it's a chronic lifelong illness that requires medicine. Things have changed, and why have they changed? Well, the pharmaceutical companies did a really good job of marketing this. Mm -hmm. And I think it's for all of us, though, I will say to anybody out there taking medicine, if you feel it's working for you, I support that a thousand percent. Okay? But just be aware of your own self-awareness if you start to notice things that are uncomfortable or distressing, or you're not getting the effect you want, or the doctor keeps telling you, you know, we just need to keep upping your dose. If they tell you that they just keep upping your dose. What that really means is the medicine's not working. And I don't care if you up it a thousand times, it's not going to work. And what you're really doing is just creating distance that you're going to have to come back down from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just think that love and connection are a hell of a lot better than Prozac and so. Wow. And again, real quick with the depression, if you think of us freezing, what's the number one thing we always used to talk about with depression? Exercise. Well, what's the opposite of being in a frozen state is movement, is fighting and flighting. We have to go from freezing oftentimes through fight or flight before we get back to normal. And that's another thing that happens. A lot of us have been in a frozen state for a long time because of trauma. And then we start to come out of it and we get very symptomatic because we're in a fight or flight mode. So we get angry and irritable and argumentative because our body's actually healing. But the problem is, is the mental health system doesn't see that as healing, it says see that as an emergence of new symptoms that need to be medicated and then rinse and repeat. And the cycle just becomes a vicious over and over cycle. Right. Yeah, all that makes total sense. All right, let's look to the comments and see um, if anybody has anything to say. I think we have like 10 minutes left. Um, do you believe slow tapering lessens a chance of withdrawal akathisia? Um, I know Dr. Shipko commented in his practice, he saw people taper over years and still get akathisia and people who cold turkey or rapid taper off also get it. Well, I think first off there's in everything, there's no, we have general kind of rules, but there's idiosyncrasies within all those rules. Clearly somebody slow tapering is gonna have a much better chance of not having these symptoms than somebody that rapid tapers. That's just logical. Yes, there are people that have soft cold turkey, 10 milligrams of clonopin and had no problems, okay? But I wouldn't be the one willing to take that risk. And, you know, I think that it's just important that we feel like we're being hurt, you know? I think too, just to add on to what you just said, Chris, there's a lot of variability in, in the definite, we've been talking a lot about language in this interview and language is so important. And when I hear the word slow taper, well, slow means something different to a lot of different people, right? So well, you could have taken five years to taper, but the first move you made was you cut your dose in 50% or something. And then you took four and a half years to do the rest, but you destabilized yourself so badly in the beginning by making such a giant cut that the slow part of slow taper doesn't really matter anymore. You see what I'm saying? So like, well, it's, it's you the have same. to know the whole history of each person to really make an assessment of how they got where they are and that kind of thing. I'm not saying that people who do perfectly slow tapers where you would look back on it and say, yeah, that was, that was as good a taper as anybody could have done, could not get akathisia. They, there probably are people who do anyways, but right. it's probably much more minimized when you do a slow taper and you do it properly um, than people who cold turkey. I mean, that's the whole reason we taper, you that's know. Taper. And I think, you know, it's, it's landing the plane gently versus crashing it into the ground, but yeah. The other thing too, I, I deal all day talking to people and they're like, I did a slow taper and I ask them and they're like, yeah, it was six months. And I'm like, that's not a slow taper. See, the irony is the five day detox, the five day taper they did to me, I was told it was a slow taper. <laughs> yeah. I look at tapering in dog years. One year of a normal thing is seven years of tapering. Okay, because 
I'm tapering now medicine that I was given in the detox six years ago. I'm going at a pace that I can function that will now take me eight more years. Yes, eight more years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people are going, oh my God, you're going to be exposed to the drug for that long. That's going to be worse than the taper. No, it's not. I cut, I try to cut faster and I'm cutting really slow and I feel it. As a therapist, um, you see patients or clients, I'm sorry, um, with experiencing withdrawal. How do you work with them? And is therapy even helpful for those patients or clients? I would say it's also not a black and white. You know, there's people in very differing degrees of, of withdrawal. I mean, I, I have clients that are in withdrawal that do therapy with me because their withdrawal is, 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 is there, but they can still get in touch with their feelings. They can still be the human I need across from me to do actual work with. But when somebody's really struggling, really what I'm doing is reassurance and comfort and hopefulness and encouragement and pull, you know, one of the analogies I use is, I'm pulling you towards me, okay? I'm healthy now. And you know, that's what I can offer. And then the other thing that I really think is incredibly important is I can talk to significant others and I can talk to parents and spouses and children. And, 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 and I, I hope I come across as relatively rational and I can at least show them from a medical perspective. I think that's the other problem too, is that we have people doing this supportive life and they don't have the background to really cross over and have any credibility. Mm -hmm. We need credibility to get this movement where we want it to be, which is prevention, awareness, and treatment, and research. Mm -hmm. And that's where I hope a year from now when I'm talking to Nicole about this again, we'll have seen a lot of changes. So what are some therapists doing? Um, like I know in my own experience, I... I knew that I wasn't in any place to get any kind of therapy or whatever, but I also knew that my chances of going out into the world and finding a therapist who was going to offer what I needed in the condition that I was in was probably not out there or yeah. it was, you know, like a needle in a haystack. So what, what do you want to say to therapists out there who, you know, might be encountering clients who are in withdrawal or who are having adverse effects from medications, where do they go or how do they learn how to be somebody? I think the irony is, and I learned this a long time ago and it had nothing to do with academia, was even if a client is highly delusional, believe them. Mm -hmm. Believe what they're telling you. Hear them. That's the only place I harbor any resentment and anger at doctors on, is they just didn't listen. Mm -hmm. If they would have just opened their ears and, and checked their ego for a second, and as a human to human said, I see you're in pain. And here I am, you know, I mean, do you know how many, I mean, how many times they were like, yeah, sure, you're a therapist. You know? <laughs> sure, you are a crazy guy, you know. But yeah. how many times, even me, with the language and the background and the ability to communicate, was being gaslit by these doctors and denied what was happening. So if I, it can happen to me and as educated and armed with knowledge as I was, I can only imagine the horror for the average person. Yeah. So at the end of the day, and it's had nothing to do with academia, believe your patients, believe your clients. And that's what we need more than anything. Should should someone in withdrawal who is, you know, therapist shopping you know, what if they find somebody who? I mean, maybe, maybe I would take an article or two that they found that was relevant and thought well presented and give it to the therapist. If the therapist is willing to read it and listen, that to me would be a big indication that, because to me, I found doctors and therapists that don't know it, but they're willing to learn. That to me is the differential variable of what I'm looking for. It's just, you might not know. I don't expect you to know. I was a therapist for 24 years teaching master's level students about psychopathology, and I didn't. Mm -hmm. But what I'm asking is just listen and believe me and, and hear me. And if you do that, then we can come to a common ground again where I can get the social support and help I need. Yeah. And if they don't, I mean, it goes for all medical professionals, really. I mean, that's part of being your own best health advocate, right, is you can fire doctors and you can fire therapists and you can find a good fit 
if yep. the person you're working with is not collaborating with you, they're not willing to hear you, they're not willing to read something that you bring to them, you know, unfortunately, I think just people in withdrawal <laughs> have to do a lot of firing because, yeah, you know, it's just, it's hard to find people it's really in the hard. field. It's really hard. It yeah. So, okay. I think we are at closing time. Um, Chris, do you want to tell people, um, somebody asked if you support people. And so do you want to tell people about where to find you and any sure. closing thoughts you might have? Um, you can find me at Chris Page and it's P-A-I-G-E-L-C-S-W.com. And there's an email, you know, correspondence there that you can reach me. Um, I think the best thing I can offer for people going through this is support, validation, love, connection, and like I said, any other support you need with any part of your system that needs education. Or like I said before, the other thing that I think all these families need is somebody to say, I know you're scared. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know you're scared, but don't take the fear out on your loved one. Okay. And I think sometimes if I can just say to them, they're scared too, they go, oh, okay. Somebody sees me too. Mm -hmm. And everybody's scared that's going through this. And if we can get the system less scared, then the system can be more supportive and loving. And outside of that, for therapy, anybody in, interested in psychotherapy, I offer what I call central nervous system and colon therapy, where we will explore trauma and I have very specific helpful techniques, I think that can reduce and reset your nervous system in very gentle and healthy ways. And I hope you can see for the last hour, I'm very passionate about this and very interested in this and I welcome the opportunity to speak to any of you. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm just gonna give some closing thoughts here. Um, we have more interviews that will be coming down the line. You can find them under our um, events tab on the Medicating Normal Facebook page. If you haven't seen the Medicating Normal film yet, please check our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch. Um, there is a list of upcoming community screenings there. We add new ones all the time, so check back frequently. Um, we also currently release new videos on our YouTube channel every Wednesday and Friday at noon central US time. And we'll be having more live interviews here on Facebook every other week or so. Um, if you have any suggestions for who you'd like us to have as a guest, you can leave them in the comments section below. Um, and if you'd like to support our outreach efforts to bring the film and conversations like this one to communities worldwide, you can also make a donation to the film at medicatingnormal.com slash donate. So thanks everybody who tuned in today and left questions for Chris and thanks most of all to Chris Page for spending an hour with us and um, that's it. So bye everybody and we'll see you soon. Bye Chris. <laughs>